Welcome to Card Spotlight, a new series focusing on numerous uses for a single card. Today we're looking at Karn the Great Creator. Karn has been a staple of the major competitive format since its printing, represented in multiple viable decks in Pioneer, Modern, and Legacy. Because of its diverse abilities and use cases, it can be played in a variety of strategies, including control decks, prison, mid-range, and combo. Karn itself can be a de facto combo piece, value engine, or toolbox card. For those unfamiliar with the card, I'll start by breaking down each of its abilities before moving on to the numerous uses it has with other cards. Karn's first ability is a static effect that prevents your opponents from activating artifact abilities. A one-sided stony silence, Karn stops artifact lands from tapping for mana, equipment from being equipped, vehicles from crewing, and the multitudes of other artifacts with various activated abilities. Since most decks aren't artifact-based and may not play any artifacts at all, this ability is either a nice bonus against artifact decks like Affinity, or something to combine with Karn's activated abilities. Notably, this ability is significantly better in Vintage due to the format's abundance of Moxon, Black Lotus, and artifact-related powerhouses like Mishra's Workshop. The second ability costs plus one loyalty and turns a non-creature artifact into a creature with power and toughness equal to its mana value. This demonstrates the first use for Karn, turning your own artifacts into creatures to attack or block with. Although it can be tempting to turn an expensive artifact into a large attacker, the value of your artifacts is usually better than the risk of them being susceptible to creature-specific removal, so you don't often target your own permanence unless it's very important to race your opponent or protect Karn from attackers. The second use is turning opposing non-creature artifacts into creatures. This can be done either because you have removal that only hits creatures and not artifacts, or because of the power toughness clause. To explain, since the artifact becomes a creature whose toughness is equal to its mana value, you can turn zero mana artifacts into creatures with zero toughness, thus destroying them. This applies to various cards such as Moxon, Lotus Petal, and Artifact Lands. Although Karn's static ability means those cards can't be activated anyway, plusing them does get rid of them permanently in case Karn is dealt with, and also applies to zero mana artifacts without activated abilities like Chalice of the Void. Also, you can plus on equipment to cause it to fall off whatever it's attached to, such as Cauldra from its Germ or Colossus Hammer. Speaking of Cauldra, you can also plus on your own Cauldra to turn it into an indestructible 7-7 in cases where the Germ died somehow. This ability is fairly limited, however, and, again, mostly combines with the third ability. So, moving on to the third ability, which is the best and most important one. Karn can minus two to retrieve an artifact from your sideboard or, incredibly, the exile zone as well. This means you can fill your sideboard with combo pieces, stacks cards, threats, win cons, and all manner of other silver bullet toolbox cards for various uses, cards which often combine with Karn's other two abilities. And to reiterate, you can get back cards from Exile, including from temporary effects like Leyline Binding. Which exact artifacts you can grab and play in a timely manner depend on how much mana you have access to. Many decks will play Karn on turn 4 and need to wait a turn before playing whatever it grabbed, whereas decks like Tron and Nykthos Ramp have access to a ton of mana and may be able to play the artifact Karn retrieves on the same turn or play much more expensive ones. So, let's go through the various options. Notably, the cards presented in this video are only the best options at the moment and could be supplanted in the future. As a side note, Karn isn't good in Commander since its best ability, the minus two, mostly doesn't do anything since the format doesn't include sideboards. Combo Pieces and Win Cons The first and most attractive option is making it so that Karn can win the game on its own or be the second piece in a game-winning combo, subbing in for whatever artifact would normally be there. Let's start with ways for Karn to win on its own. When Karn first debuted, Mycosynth Lattice became the go-to option. It's a 6-mana artifact that turns everything else into an artifact. This includes lands, which combines with Karn's static ability to make it so that the opponent can't tap their lands for mana. One way around this is for the opponent to float mana in response to you playing Lattice and then destroy it with something that targets artifacts, but this requires them to immediately have open mana and an instant that can hit artifacts. If they don't, their lands are locked out for the rest of the game. This means that, as long as you have reasonable control of the board, with your opponent not having any easy way to attack Karn, resolving Lattice wins the game on the spot. Lattice was subsequently banned in Modern, but it's still legal in Legacy. Stepping forward to Modern, the next closest effect to Lattice and a staple in Karn wishboards is Liquid Metal Coating, a 2-mana artifact that can tap to turn another permanent into an artifact. Since Coating can target lands, you can turn the opponent's lands into artifacts and snipe them with Karn's plus 1 ability, destroying them one at a time over multiple turns since they turn into zero toughness creatures. Because this process is slow, it does give your opponent multiple turns to get rid of Karn or Coating, but they will lose if they don't find an out quickly. Next up is Walking Ballista. 
Ballista can be fine on its own, especially in decks like Tron where the abundance of mana let you play it with 3, 4, 5 or more counters, which can be good enough to win the game by itself. However, it's also the best payoff when you have infinite mana since it'll deal infinite damage. Infinite mana is of course generated by a separate combo, but in some cases you can assemble that combo with Karn itself. More on that later. An important use case for Karn is that it retrieves artifacts not only from your sideboard, but also from exile. This means if your artifacts are exiled by your opponent, or by their own effect, you can retrieve them. This is important for certain combos, but also for strategic gameplay patterns. For example, if your opponent tried to exile Ballista via Solitude, Leyline Binding, Prismatic Ending, whatever, previously, the best course of action was to simply sacrifice Ballista by removing all its counters in response. Now, the best option is often to remove all but one counter from Ballista and let it be exiled so that you can retrieve it with Karn later. The Stone Brain is an important silver bullet Karn can use to neuter combo and synergy decks like Cascade, Lotus Field, etc. However, because Stone Brain exiles itself, you can keep getting it back with Karn and, if you have enough time, eventually strip your opponent of every relevant card in their deck. Or, if you have another combo that lets you loop Karn and Stone Brain over and over in the same turn, immediately exile your opponent's entire deck. Next are cards that may or may not win the game by themselves, but at least tip things in your favor to such a degree that even if you technically haven't won, you basically have. These cards usually cost a lot and are more easily used in decks like Tron or Nykthos Ramp. Sundering Titan can be deployed against myriad greedy land bases, especially in Modern where decks are splashing into all five land types for cards like Leyline Binding. While it technically doesn't win on the spot, destroying five opposing lands basically does. Mindslaver lets you take over your opponent's turn and set them back significantly by making bad attacks, wasting spells, casting removal on their own stuff, cracking fetch lands for nothing, and so on. If you have Academy Ruins and 12 mana in a deck like Mono Blue Tron, you can loop Mindslaver every turn to win. Ugin's Nexus is a 5 mana artifact that, when sacrificed, lets you take an extra turn. It also exiles itself, meaning Karn can get it back. So, you can generate enormous value as long as you have a way to sacrifice it. Karn does have to minus 2 to get it back, so this isn't infinite, but taking 3 turns in a row is still really good. Possessed Portal is an expensive artifact that stops players from drawing cards, period, and causes each player to sacrifice a permanent every turn. You can break parity by using Karn to find value-generating artifacts like Mystic Forge and play at least 2 more permanents each turn, meaning your opponent will run out of permanents while you won't. This is a stacks win condition used in prison or combo decks like Dice Factory or Prison Tron. Next are combo cards that require multiple pieces from Karn. Paradox Engine untaps each non-land permanent you control whenever you cast a spell, which can be combined with Mana Rocks or Dorks to generate infinite mana by tapping for more mana than the cost of the spell you cast. It can also multiply tap abilities. Ancestral Statue is a 4 mana artifact creature that returns a permanent to your hand when it enters, which can include itself. So, with Paradox Engine and either a way to reduce Statue's cost or with non-land permanents with mana abilities, you can cast Statue, bounce itself, and recast it over and over. This generates an infinite storm count and infinite mana if the loop is mana positive. If you have infinite mana, you can just grab Walking Ballista, but if you don't have infinite mana or you're playing Pioneer where Ballista is banned, you can instead get Aetherflux Reservoir and then cast any spell to trigger Reservoir, gaining infinite life and thus dealing infinite damage. Magistrate Scepter places charge counters on itself and removes them to take an extra turn. With Paradox Engine and enough mana and spells, you can put multiple charge counters on it and take infinite turns. This is one of the combo pieces used in Dice Factory, where it synergizes with other cards like Power Conduit, Core Tapper, and Manifold Key. Many of the artifact combo pieces like Paradox Engine, Ancestral Statue, and Aetherflux Reservoir don't have to exclusively combo with each other and can instead combo with anything that satisfies their conditions. Paradox Engine with anything that adds mana or taps combined with multiple spells or recasting the same spell, Statue to generate infinite storm count or enter the battlefield triggers, and Reservoir with anything that gains a substantial amount of life, chains multiple spells back to back, or creates a high storm count. This is something that's true for many of the combos presented here. They're dynamic and can combo with many different cards. For example, with Paradox Engine, you can use Emery to cast a zero mana artifact that sacrifices itself from your graveyard, such as Lotus Petal, Tormod's Crypt, or multiple Mox, Ambers, or Opals that Legend rule each other out, triggering Paradox Engine, which untaps Emery, then sacrifice the artifact and cast it again with Emery to go infinite. This is one of the combos in Pioneer's Kinon deck. However, if you're looking for a way to combo Paradox Engine with just Karn, you'll have to look at artifacts exclusively. Next are cards that combo with other cards in the main deck. Sometimes this means you can play three copies of each combo piece in the main and have the fourth copy in the sideboard, meaning Karn is effectively copies four through seven of the combo. 
Lion's Eye Diamond plus Oriok Salvagers is a combo that generates infinite mana in Legacy's Bomberman deck since LED generates more mana than Salvagers costs to get it back, for which Karn can be LED numbers 4 through 7. Painter's Servant plus Grindstone is a combo in Legacy in which Grindstone mills the opponent until they hit two cards whose colors don't match, and Painter grants all cards the same color, meaning they mill infinitely. Since both cards are artifacts, you can play three of each in the main and one of each in the side for Karn to retrieve. Similarly, some decks run Helm of Obedience as a way to infinitely mill the opponent in combination with cards like Rest in Peace or Leyline of the Void. Devoted Druid is a mana dork that taps to add a mana and can untap by putting negative counters on itself. Druid can combo with the equipment Luxior since the plus it gives counteracts the negative counters on Druid, letting you tap for infinite green mana. Aside from mana, Druid's ability to untap infinitely can then also deal infinite damage with Viridian Longbow, another artifact commonly played in Devoted Druid combo decks. A similar equipment, Umbral Mantle, combos with any creature that generates more mana than it costs to untap it with Mantle to make infinite mana and, even if it's mana neutral, to grow to infinite power. Thopter Foundry plus Sword of the Meek is a combo in which Foundry can sacrifice Sword to create a 1-1, which triggers Sword to return from the graveyard, meaning you can create as many 1-1s and gain as much life as mana you have to activate Foundry. This is a combo normally played in Urza or Myria decks since, when combined with either of those cards, it actually does go infinite, but even just Foundry plus Sword can be enough to win some games. Generating tons of fodder artifact tokens via Foundry and Sword or by other means can also combo with Time Sieve to take infinite turns. And these last two combos are played exclusively in the Pioneer Nykthos Ramp deck. Pestilent Cauldron is a double-faced card with the Sorcery Restorative Burst on its backside, but since the Cauldron's front side is an artifact, it's retrievable by Karn, and since Burst exiles itself, Karn can get it back over and over. I've already explained the combo in my Nykthos Ramp video, so here's an excerpt from that. For the combo, you'll need two Kioras, two Karns, a way to generate black mana, and enough green pips to generate 14 mana with Nykthos. Because Restorative Burst exiles itself, you can retrieve it with Karn since its front half is an artifact. Using a combination of Kioras and Karns, you can untap Nykthos for mana, retrieve Cauldron with Karn, then play a new Kiora and Karn, Legend ruling the previous two and fetching them back with Burst as long as you have 14 mana from Nykthos to cast everything. This will gain you and your opponent infinite life. Then, as long as you can make one black mana with something like Sylvan Karyatid or Treasure Vault, you can cast Pestilent Cauldron on its front half and activate its second ability, milling your opponent for infinite cards. Having the resources for the combo is a lot to ask, but it is a way to win long games when the board is stalled. Alternatively, in lieu of a second copy of each walker legend ruling them out, you can use Heart of Kirin to crew sacrifice them. The Chain Veil can either reduce the amount of mana you need for the Cauldron combo since it lets you activate Kiora and Karn multiple times, or it can combo with Teferi who slows the sunset. Teferi's plus ability untaps an artifact, creature, and land, with the artifact being Chain Veil. Then, as long as the creature and land you're untapping make at least 4 mana for Chain Veil, you can activate Teferi again, gaining infinite life, infinite mana if you can make at least 5 mana, and letting you activate Karn infinitely as well. Karn can then win by retrieving other combo artifacts like the Stone Brain. Sticking with Nykthos, Woodcaller Automaton can be used to untap Nykthos once, and it even adds 2 more green pips to the board. Next up are Silver Bullets. These are cards that are your typical niche sideboard cards against specific strategies, like Graveyard Hate against Dredge and Spell Hate against Cascade or Storm. While it's normally correct to leave artifacts in the sideboard for Karn, there are times when it's better to bring them in, usually because at 4 mana, Karn is too slow against some fast strategies. For example, it can be better to bring in Graveyard Hate against Dredge since the deck will usually pop off by turn 2. It's also important not to hinder your own game plan with silver bullets that affect you, so don't run Damping Sphere if you're playing Tron. The best options depend on how much mana you have, how quickly you need the effect, and what other things they do, such as generating value or comboing with other cards. You may also want to play slightly more expensive silver bullets to get around Chalice of the Void. Anyway, the best Graveyard Hate cards are Relic of Progenitus, Soul Guide Lantern, Tormod's Crypt, Unlicensed Hearse, and Nile Spellbomb. Nile Spellbomb is obviously only applicable if you have black mana. Curse is a threat as well, but also the least efficient graveyard hate card, both in terms of its cost and how many cards it exiles. Tormod's Crypt is for if you need the effect immediately and don't have extra mana, or if it costing zero helps in other ways, like comboing with Paradox Engine and Emery. The split over whether to play Lantern or Relic usually comes down to how important your own graveyard is. That is, if you have graveyard synergies, you probably don't want to exile your own cards with Relic. 
Notably, any of these silver bullets that exile cards from your own graveyard combine with Karn since he retrieves cards from exile, with Relic being particularly useful since it exiles itself. In fact, Relic is a great way to get back other artifacts that have been sent away via destroy effects or counter spells. Grafdigger's Cage and Weathered Runestone also affect graveyards but not in the same way and are usually worse than the other cards for that purpose. However, their secondary effect of preventing permanents from being cheated in in various ways are good if you expect to face decks like Coco and Chalice of the Void, Trinisphere, and sometimes Void Mirror, but primarily Chalice and Trinisphere, are used to fight decks which either cast things for free or want to cast many spells. First, they all stop Cascade. Second, Chalice and Trinisphere are great against Spellslinger or Storm decks looking to play many cheap spells in the same turn, with Chalice outright countering them and Trinisphere significantly taxing them. Trinisphere is usually played in Tron, where the 7 mana means they can land it and Karn in the same turn. It's also good for taxing free spells like the Forces and Evoke Elementals, which Chalice doesn't tax. Void Mirror is significantly more niche since it targets spells cast without paying colored mana, though it does stop Cascade, Pact, Pitch spells, and notably, colorless only decks like Tron. However, the various colorless decks often have ways of getting around it. For example, Tron has eggs that can make colored mana and enough green lands to circumvent it. Speaking of taxes on spells, Karn has access to various taxing effects such as God Pharaoh's Statue, Thorn of Amethyst, and Sphere of Resistance. Thorn and Sphere are primarily for taxing cheap spell decks in Legacy. Statue is a more generic effect that, while it costs a lot more to cast, significantly disrupts many more decks and is a mainstay in Pioneer's Nykthos ramp. Depending on which deck you're up against, it can sometimes win almost by itself, such as versus Is It Phoenix. Damping Sphere is also a taxing card, but only specifically against Storm decks. Its primary use is attacks against lands and fast mana, being able to significantly disrupt Tron, Lotus Field, and the bounce lands in Amulet Titan. Torpor Orb shuts off all creature ETB effects, which is great against decks that play a lot of them like Elementals and Scam. It also stops any combos that involve ETBs, such as the Thopter Foundry plus Sword of the Meat combo. Pithing Needle and Sorceress Spyglass shut down various activated abilities like Planeswalkers, Manlands, and combo artifacts. This is also a prime example of where you might want a more expensive card to get around Chalice of the Void, such as an Eldrazi Tron which plays 4 chalices and could therefore want Spyglass instead of Needle. Ensnaring Bridge is a panic button to stop a developed board of attackers from your opponent from killing you. It doesn't always work since you may not be able to get to a low enough hand count quick enough, there are ways around it, and there's a lot more artifact hate than there used to be. But sometimes it does work and it buys you the time you need. Next up are removal spells of various sorts. Cards that hit creatures, artifacts and enchantments, are all-purpose removal, or are sweepers. It's usually good to have at least one piece of all-purpose removal, even if it's expensive. This used to be Meteor Golem, but it's since been replaced by Cityscape Leveler. Cityscape Leveler is not only a removal spell, it's also a huge threat that must be dealt with, and it continues to be removal with each subsequent attack. The Power Stone token it leaves behind for your opponent is mostly useless, but even if they have a use for it, Karn stops them from activating it. Its ability is a cast trigger, meaning you get it even if it's countered. The Unearth ability brings it back for another go around even if it's destroyed or countered, and, notably, exiles itself, meaning Karn can get it back. If you have some sort of sacrifice shenanigans, you can play Spine of Ishsaw instead to cast, sack, and replay it. Haywire Might is the go-to for getting rid of artifacts and enchantments, especially since it exiles them, although it is limited to only non-creatures. Engineered Explosives is a good way to get rid of multiple things or get around Hexproof, even for decks that are only one color. Ratchet Bomb has a similar effect, but I'd caution against it. It's nearly always less efficient than EE and too slow, especially since you usually can't do anything with it the turn you play it. The only exception I'd make is in decks that can specifically move counters onto it, like Dice Factory with Power Conduit and Core Tapper. For more and bigger sweepers, you can look to Oblivion Stone, often played as a one of in Tron's sideboard. In Pioneer, where stone isn't legal, Karn Silex is the next best option, though it's slow since it enters tapped and therefore can't be activated the turn you play it, although Kiora can untap it. Once again, it exiles itself and can therefore be retrieved later. The anti-life payment effect can also have niche uses against cards like Gristlebrand, Yawgmoth, and Fetchlands. Sky Sovereign is a repeatable lightning bolt stapled to a threat and a mainstay in Pioneer Nykthos ramp. Notably, vehicles are one of the few cases where Karn's plus ability is actually useful since you can turn them into creatures without crewing them. Similar to Sky Sovereign, the Might Stone and Weak Stone can be used as removal and kills bigger creatures than Sky Sovereign does, or, if you don't need removal, draws two cards instead. It has worse long-term value than Sky Sovereign, but a better effect up front, more options, and even adds a bit more mana for your other artifacts or to activate Nykthos. 
if you have access to white mana, portable hull, and glass casket are cheap options for dealing with small threats. So with removal out of the way, let's move on to threats and value engines. We've already covered some of them in other sections like Cityscape Leveler and Sundering Titan, so here we're focused on cards with a narrower use. Mystic Forge and Bolas' Citadel are perhaps the best value engines. With a correctly built deck, you can play one card after another off the top with ease. They're so good that they're almost combo cards in and of themselves. The restrictions are that Mystic Forge needs a primarily colorless or artifact deck and can't play lands, and Bolas' Citadel needs cheap spells or life gain effects and can't play multiple lands. Citadel is also capable of playing zero mana spells for free, including the Cascade payoffs. Either way, both cards benefit significantly from anything that lets you manipulate the top card like search effects, fetch lands, and so on. Mystic Forge can also combine with Paradox Engine to keep exiling the top card as needed. Moving to lower mana values, Maze Mine Tome, Reckoner Bankbuster, and the Reality Chip all represent cheaper but slower ways of accruing more cards. If you have enough artifacts to lessen its cost, you can put Thought Monitor in the sideboard for a quick burst of new cards. Golos is a good choice if lands are important to your strategy, such as in the Cabal Coffers deck. Just make sure you can activate its 7 mana ability and stick Cascading Cataracts in your deck if necessary. Lastly, these next cards are all expensive and more on the threat side. Batterskull, Wormcoil Engine, and Phyrexian Fleshgorger are all large, lifelinking creatures, with Batterskull able to be re-equipped or bounced and replayed, and the latter two often having a price to get rid of for the opponent, each of which represent large stop gaps against aggro decks. Fleshgorger is the more costly one to get rid of since its ward price also applies to exile effects, but Wormcoil has some niche uses whereby you can blow it up yourself for value with cards like Oblivion Stone. If you need life gain at a cheaper rate and have large enough creatures in the main anyway, you can sideboard Shadow Spear or Basilisk Caller instead. The Death Touch from Caller can also combine with Walking Ballista to make each ping lethal. Portal to Phyrexia is the most expensive card we've seen so far and has a devastating effect if applicable, but is a lot more narrow since it only applies against creature decks. It's arguably more of a removal spell, but I'd say you're playing it more for the long-term value it creates. Finally, the last section is for miscellaneous cards that didn't have a definable purpose within the previous categories. That said, Defense Grid is a taxing silver bullet of sorts being used to force value cards or combo pieces past counterspells. Spellskite or Welding Jar can similarly be used to protect valuable cards from removal. Treasure Vault, Darksteel Citadel, or another artifact land can be put in the sideboard in case you need just one extra mana next turn. This primarily applies to Pioneer Nykthos Ramp when you're one mana short of casting Cavalier of Thorns or Sky Sovereign. Dragon's Claw is an extremely niche card if you're running a red Karn deck, such as Mono Red Prison, to sideboard against Burn, since gaining one life from every spell of theirs and some of yours can be a good way to counter their game plan. And finally, Wishclaw Talisman has a neat interaction with Karn, where the normal downside of gifting it to your opponent is negated since Karn's static ability prevents them from activating it. Just make sure that doesn't backfire if they can deal with Karn and therefore do wind up activating it. There are of course many other potential artifacts that could be paired with Karn, and there will be more in the future, but for now, the ones covered here are the best options. I hope you've enjoyed this spotlight on Karn the Great Creator. If you want to see other spotlight videos covering other cards, please share your thoughts in the comments. A big thank you to my supporters, and if you enjoy these videos, consider supporting the channel. Take care.